Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Uh, this session, we want to begin uh, some discussions of some of the minor prophets. If you have your Bible, take it and turn to the book of Joel, the first chapter of Joel, and let's start reading about verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before your eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds shrivel under the clods, storehouses are in shambles, barns are broken down, for the grain has withered, how the animals groan. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. O oh Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up. The fire has devoured the open pastures. Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Okay. That sounds like something we need to know what it is. Can you help us out? Yes, I can. Uh, Joel, one of the minor prophets, there are 12 of them there in the Old Testament, near the end of the Old Testament as we put it together. And Joel probably happened somewhere around 700, 800, B.C. before Christ. We don't know exactly when he should be dated. But um, and when Joel, probably just before he began his prophetic work, there was a plague of locusts. And those, that plague of locusts just devastated the country. The, the grasshoppers or locusts in that part of the world are four to six inches long and their wings spread out and it is just incredible. They can consume an enormous amount of stuff and they come. Well, let me read you just one uh, brief account of something that happened a little less than 100 years ago now. We had a famine in the second year of the war. That was 1915. Such as we had not experienced in 50 years, the sky was darkened by the gigantic swarms of locusts which covered the whole country and neither sun nor moon could be seen. All of Palestine was transformed into a desert within a few days. All trees from their tops to the ground, including the bark, were eaten up clean. Our vegetable gardens, cultivated with so much labor, disappeared as if by magic. The following spring there crept forth from hundreds of billions of eggs the new brood, which consumed the little that had been left. The result was a terrible famine. So Joel picks this very disaster up and he says what can we learn about this does this have anything to do with God is God responsible and that reminds me of something written in much more modern times by the paraphraser of uh, the message Bible and he comments about Joel like this when disaster strikes understanding of God is at risk unexpected illness or death national catastrophe social disruption personal loss, plague or epidemic, devastation by flood or drought, turn men and women who haven't given God a thought in years into instant theologians. <laughs> Rumors fly, God is absent, God is angry, God is playing favorites and I'm not one of the favorites. God is ineffectual, God is hanging a, holding a grudge from a long time ago and now we're paying for it. 
It is the task of the prophet to stand up at such times of catastrophe and clarify who God is and how he acts. If the prophet is good, that is, accurate and true, the disaster becomes a lever for prying people's lives loose from their sins and setting them free for God. Joel is one of the good ones. He used a current event in Israel as a text to call his people to an immediate awareness that there wasn't a day that went by that they weren't dealing with God. We are always dealing with God. The event that Joel used as his text was a terrible locust plague that was devastating the crops of Israel, creating an agricultural disaster of major proportions. He compared it to a massive military invasion, but any catastrophe would have served him as well. He projected it onto a big screen and used it to focus to, I'm sorry, used it to focus the reality of God in the lives of the people. Then he expanded the focus to include everything and everyone everywhere. The whole world crowded into Decision Valley for God's verdict. This powerful picture has kept God's people alert to the eternal consequences of their decisions for many centuries. There is a sense in which catastrophe doesn't introduce anything new into our lives. It simply exposes the moral or spiritual reality that already exists, but was hidden beneath an overlay of routine, self-preoccupation, and business as usual. Then suddenly there is before us a moral universe in which our accumulated decisions on, which we sit, on what we say and do, on how we treat others, on whether or not we will obey God's commands, are set in the stark light of God's judgment. In our everyday experience, right and wrong, and the decisions we make about them seldom come to us neatly packaged and precisely defined. Joel's prophetic words continue to reverberate down through the generations, making the ultimate connection between anything small or large that disrupts our daily routine and God, giving us fresh opportunity to reorient our, reorient our lives in faithful obedience. Joel gives us opportunity for deathbed repentance before we die, while there is still time and space for a lot of good living to the glory of God. So the first big question that we have to ask ourselves when we come to a book like Joel, who talks about it so much, is what is the day of the Lord? Is, your all, is it all perfectly obvious? Is there only one? Is there only one? That's the verse, next question. Chapter 2, verse 11. The day of the Lord is great and terrible, or mm -hmm. very terrible. Who can endure it? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's quite dramatic. Ominous, huh? Yes. Well, if you talk, if you read through the book of Joel, you find out that there's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome time and a pretty serious time. Um, so, does that mean that um, it was something that happened back in Joel's day? Is the day of the Lord back in Joel's day? Well, what's the, what's the purpose here? I mean, um, if it's so great to have the Lord come and shake things up, why doesn't He do it more? Well, there's, that's a question. I mean, is a tsunami a day of the Lord? Well, it is for some people, thousands of them. Is a, a massive earthquake a day of the Lord? It is for some people. So it, it's going to happen no matter what. I mean, that's the kind of planet we live mm -hmm. on. Yeah. So are we looking for the shaking up time? For the, to well, keep our health, spiritual health up. What is what is what is Joel saying to us about that? He said one thing that sort of wakes people up, and, and this is a major issue in the Old Testament. When God does something that, or, or takes advantage of something that's happened like this, and sort of shakes people up, everybody says, "Oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, 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 okay, let's get in line, let's do it." And as soon as things quiet down again, okay, everything's sort of quiet again. Oh, okay, back to business as usual, you know. Well, the real question is, what is God's role in these, in these days? Well, what do we attribute to God, or how, do, or, or how do we explain God's behavior in them or through them? And do we really have to explain it all the time? I mean, there's Do we have things, to say that God's involved? Is, are you asking? Or? Well, um, I'm, I'm thinking about people who... who have loved ones killed mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. and then they come up. People, other people come up and come up with their greatest, you know, 
theory about what happened, you know, and explaining why the there Lord let this happen. Must have been some sin in their life, you mean, or, or something like that? Anything. It could be anything, but they always come up with some reason for it, um, and I don't know if it really makes them feel better or not. Well, it's interesting that New Testament writers picked up this theme from Joel and talked about it quite a lot. Matthew, Mark, Luke have whole chapters about the day of the Lord and what's coming and so forth in terms of Jesus' prophesies, prophecies of the future. And you remember Peter, when it came the day of Pentecost, he quoted from Joel. Yeah. Christ knew about Joel. Mm -hmm. Regarding the verses that I read at the beginning, yeah. the author of Great Controversies has this to say, these plagues are not universal, nor the inhabitants of earth would be wholly cut off. Yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. So I would assume that th she's looking at this and kind of looking towards the very end of... Well, here's, here's, here's how that came about. In the years after the Babylonian captivity, uh, Israel, a, re a very small percentage of them came back to Palestine and gradually built up Jerusalem again and gradually started spreading out into the countryside and so forth. And they were faced with a conundrum because here were all these prophecies they had from the Old Testament here that seemed to suggest there's going to be marvelous things in, in the future for for them as a nation, and here they are, a little pittance of a people here, just almost nobody, and they're being, you know, bandied around and, and bought from this side to the other side for the enemies, and boy, it didn't seem like any of these prophecies could ever prove too. So what are you going to do? Are you going to say God lied to us? You know, what are you going to say about all these prophecies? And so it gradually, over a couple centuries, it de they developed the idea it was going to be like this, that that even though things look bad now, maybe they're getting worse and worse and worse, suddenly something's going to happen. And of course, in their minds, it was going to be the coming of the Messiah. And the coming of the Messiah would be the day of the Lord. You could see how the day of the Lord would fit with the coming of the Messiah. And the Messiah would miraculously turn everything around and suddenly all these prophecies would come true and they would be the conquerors of the world and they would rule again like the days of David and Solomon. And so the, the day of the Lord came to be a symbol for that time when suddenly miraculous things are going to happen. Maybe the Messiah is going to come and we're going to, be, we're going to go from the bottom of the heap to the top of the heap. That's sort of... Now that hasn't happened yet. Is it going to happen or is this figurative language for God's people and the second coming of Jesus. Well, what's going to happen at the second coming of people of Jesus? What's going to happen to God's people at the second coming of Jesus? They're going to inhabit uh, a wonderful land. But at the time, I'm talking about right at the time, just before and through they're, the time. And they're hiding in little groups up in the mountains, surrounded by enemies. They look like they're going to, threatened. with their lives threatened, they look like they're going out. It's mm -hmm. all over. Mm -hmm. And then Satan it changes. Satan and his dire armies are, yeah. are out there to get them. That's right. And then what happens? Well, then something happens and it all changes. The Messiah shows up. That's right. The second time, Christ. Right. And suddenly, they're the victors. So the is people this speaking like about the second coming? Yeah. Well, that's the next question. Is this talking about the second coming or is this talking about every time when something like that happens? Could it be both? Now, you, yeah. In actual fact, if you look through the Bible and you, you look for the expression, the day of the Lord, there are at least four times, I'm not going to bother to go back there right now, but there are at least four times when it speaks the, about the day of the Lord is talking about past events. Mm -hmm. So clearly the Bible writers were not limiting the day of the Lord to what we would call the second coming. But Jesus in his prophecies tends to connect the day of the Lord and the New Testament writers tend to connect the day of the Lord with the second coming, and you could see why they would natural that would see it that would seem natural to them. So but why why did God send Joel to these people? Well, he, he, here let's talk a little bit about that. 
Joel apparently lived in the days of Jeroboam the second. He was probably the most prosperous, the most um, effective king in Judah after Solomon, maybe with the exception of Hezekiah. Anyway, Jeroboam was there, and uh, I'm sorry, in the northern kingdom, and and he, he lived in a he lived in a time when Assyria, the major enemies, and Egypt were relatively weak, and so he was expanding territory and and, and, and doing that kind of stuff, and so it looked like well, and what was happening in the in connection with that is the rich were getting rich, richer and the poor were getting poor, mm -hmm. and Joel says, hey, that's not the way things are supposed to go. We're talking about something. Uh, we, we need to talk about how, you know, Christ comes, God comes, and everybody's benefited. Um, so that's basically what was going. The question I... Well, go ahead. But are we supposed to read these things that Joel said mm -hmm. as, ha as messages for them, or do they have relevance today? Both. Well, I think the answer is both. And, and what kind of relevance does that have for us today? That's the next question. Yeah, that's the next question. Well, you know, if God, let's, let's just let's break this question down a little bit. If God could win the great controversy by scaring us all, so we're standing there, you know, oh yes, whatever you say, whatever you say, we'll do it, like they did at the foot of Mount Sinai, shouldn't he have done that a long time ago? Didn't quite accomplish what he wanted. Yeah. Didn't accomplish what he wanted. Didn't work so good. Didn't work? Why? If force would work, he should have done it with Lucifer in the beginning. Yes. Okay. So fear and force don't do the job. That's what you're saying. So what does do the job? Send them into captivity. Send them into captivity. That ought to straighten. Kind of like sending a flood, right? Yeah. That's, that gets everything straightened out, right? For the moment. <laughs> for the moment. Okay. But it seems like this comes up over yeah. and over and over. It's a cycle. Yeah. Um, to prepare a people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform was to be accomplished. God saw that many of his professed people were not building for eternity. And in his mercy, he was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. Yeah. I mean, that's a message that seems to be one that is about ready for every generation. Yeah. Yeah, so what happens here? In the Bible, we see this happening. Things get really loose, and people start doing all sorts of crazy things, and then God sometimes feels, it's, not always, but often feels it's necessary to send some kind of a wake-up call. And this is a wake-up call, yeah. okay? So all of a sudden, everybody, oh, 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 what do we do now? What do we do now? And everybody says, well, what about God? And how is God involved, et cetera? And they all try to straighten their lives out and so that maybe things will be better. And then as soon as God, God says, well, you know, that's nice. It's nice to have your respect. And people are sort of listening more or less. And that's wonderful. But what happens if I turn around and show my loving side for a little bit? Everybody takes a breath, deep breath. Oh, well, okay, fine. Now we can go back to business as usual. But if this applies to the seven last plagues, mm -hmm. this is not a wake-up call. Well, it's, it's... It's too late, then. It's too late, yes. That's true. It's just a description of what's happening, then, when Satan is let loose. Because nobody changes their mind at that point in time. Okay. So let's suppose now that this day of the Lord, some people would, would want to apply that to the day of God's judgment. Tell me about God's judgment. What happens in God's judgment? Is that when God, God is making a, a judgment call, or is it when we're, we're judging about God? Well, probably both. But because, God makes his judgment call first. Uh, there's a lot of things happened before the seven last plagues. Remember the sun and the moon and the stars? There's chapter 2, uh, verse 30. I will give portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and s columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And then you've got somewhat of yes. a repeat over there in chapter 3, verse, verses 14 and 15. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Mm -hmm. So these are some 
portents that God has given to try to get people to look in the book and check things out. So, as Seventh-day Adventists, we look to a particular events of times that happened. Um, May 19, 1780, there was a, apparently a huge cloud of smoke that came from a huge forest fire somewhere in Canada that passed across the um, American Northeast, and it was a dark day. And the moon came out that night, it was like blood. And what, about 52 years, 53 years later, we had the falling of the stars. And that caused a great religious awakening because they had read verses like these verses in Joel. I think if that happened to now, I suppose someone on the news would, would discover that these verses were here, but most Americans would never even know it ever happened. So, um, back to my question. What is God doing and, and how is he involved when it comes time for judgment? Are we safe in the judgment? Let me put it this way. Are we safe in the judgment because Jesus has covered our sins with his blood or because of the way God treats all his children, even those who don't come back to him? How will God treat his erring children? What and who kills sinners in the end? Well, that's a profound well, question. Profound well, question. So. Uh, I remember a few years ago talking to my uh, high school teacher, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she she was retired, and we had just experienced the uh, the big flood uh, uh, in New Orleans with uh, with the hurricane Katrina. Katrina, and uh, uh, you know she expressed quite openly that uh, this was a judgment. Of, from God because of all of the immoral behavior uh, that was uh, going on in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought how different her view of God's behavior and my view of God's behavior are. <laughs> okay, say more. Well, do, do, do we attribute uh, you know, the tsunamis and the uh, hurricanes to God getting fed up or disturbed, or have we uh, refused him so much and so often that he just says, okay, uh, have it your way. And he steps back and we reap the consequences of what's happened. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, it has these words, tell them as surely as I, the sovereign Lord, am the living God, I do not enjoy seeing a sinner die. I would rather see him stop sinning and live. Israel, stop the evil you're doing. Why do you want to die? And there are many references that would parallel that. Luke 9, 54 to 50, 55, John 3, 17, just for example. Hebrews 2, 14, 1 John 3, 8. And then there's some, these interesting words from Ellen White once again, God destroys no man. Everyone who is destroyed will have destroyed himself. Everyone who stifles the admonitions of conscience is sowing the seeds of unbelief and these will produce a sure harvest. And um, one more, no soul, is, and that would be, by the way, that was Christ Obsolescence, page 84. Then in uh, Mount of Blessings, page 93, no soul, no soul is ever finally deserted of God and given up to his own ways so long as there's any hope of his salvation. Man turns from God, not God from him. Our Heavenly Father follows us with appeals and warnings and assurances of compassion until further opportunities and privileges um, would be wholly in vain. The responsibility rests with the sinner. By resisting the Spirit of God today, he prepares the way for a second resistance of light when it comes with mightier power. Thus he passes on from one stage of resistance to another until at last the light will fail to impress and he will cease to respond in any measure to the Spirit of God. Uh, now, it sounds to me like you're talking about responsibility there. Mm -hmm. Who's got the responsibility? But that doesn't talk about the mechanics. No. What are the mechanics? The mechanics is this. It is not God who destroys the sinner. It's the sin. sin. Do we know the mechanics of that? Sin is deadly. God told us that in one of the very first 
things he said, Genesis 2.17. The day you eat of it, you will die. Now, the mechanics may be a little different, a little difficult, but uh, I, I, I like this explanation. And I think it was 1892, Ellen White said in the Review and Herald, she said, every heartbeat is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. And what that means to me, uh, that's a poetic way of saying things, but what that means to me is that every bodily process, everything, all the laws of physics and chemistry and biology, all that stuff happens because God's power is involved. He is the one who makes it happen like that. And if he should choose to yank his power out of any of those systems, they would come unglued. And if God removed himself from us, if he stood back from us, we would be dead just like that. So, so what is judgment? Is it is it the sorting out of truth or is it a punishment that goes out? Judgment, the ultimate judgment, if we're coming now to talk about final judgment, the final judgment will happen when God says, okay, you've made up your minds. Some of you have decided to leave me and you don't want to have anything to do with me. Others of you have come and uh, have drawn closer and closer to me so that the, the, the best thing that you want to do in your lives is to become more like me. And he's just going to draw a line. Okay, some are over there and some are here and that's it. So what is, that, is, that, what? is that sorting out the truth or is that, yeah. is that a, a punishment? Well, it's not a punishment. It's, it's, it just simply people, he, he would just demonstrate that people have made their own choices. He reveals the truth. I mean, doesn't, doesn't going against the truth have its own punishment? Yeah. Well, that's what we're talking about. Here, God is, if I understand you correctly, is, is maintaining us in our sinful yes. state. Yes. Now, he there, keeps us alive. there comes a time when he doesn't maintain us in sinful state. So if you draw a line on this side of that, he's maintaining us. On the other side of that line, he's not maintaining us. Let you go. Who pulled the trigger? Well, who decided which side of the line you're going to stand? I decided which side, but I was doing just fine until well, the next second. Yeah. Then what? Because someone unplugged the li life support system, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody unplugged it. Who does that? Who can do that? Well, again, and I, I mean the Bible verses that support this, but Ellen White says very clearly that the same, well, let's just look at the best Bible verse. It's found in Isaiah 32, 33. Isaiah 33 is the best. The light is the life is the light is is the life support to those that are in harmony with the creation, and it consumes that, those that are out of harmony. That's John three seventeen to twenty one is one place. But but look at Isaiah thirty three, the Lord says to the nations, "Now I will act. I will show how powerful I am." Okay, God's going to do something, right? You make worthless plans, and everything you do is useless. My spirit is like a fire that will destroy you. You will crumble like rocks burned to make lime, like thorns burned to ashes. Let everyone near and far hear what I have done and acknowledge my power. So that ought to be enough reasons for people to say, whoa, 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 whoa hold on, wait. Well, it goes on to say, the sinful people of Zion are trembling with fright. They say God's judgment is like a fire that burns forever. Can any of us survive a fire like that? You can survive if you say and do what is right. Don't use your powers to cheat the poor and don't accept bribes. Don't join with those who plan to commit murder or do other evil things. And you have to stand by for the rest of it. Don't go away.
welcome. We're so glad you decided to stand by. Um, we were reading from Isaiah 33, starting with verse 10 and down to verse 16. It says, Don't use your power to cheat the poor. Don't accept bribes. Don't join with those who plan to commit murder to do other evil things. In other words, don't do what? Don't commit sin. Don't join the enemy's side, right? Then you will be safe. Where are you going to be safe? In the fire, right? In the fire of God's presence. You will be as secure as if in a strong fortress. You will have food to eat and water to drink. But so, he is maintaining us now, right? Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that fire now. We don't see it, that's correct. We don't see it. And we could go on this way forever. No. Unless somebody decides it's time to see it. And who makes that decision? Well, God will... It's like the flood, in, in my opinion. It was like what happened to the flood. If God, God is going to come to the point where he says, and there's nothing more to be gained by waiting any longer. But Dr. Hart, doesn't when things like this happen, I like what he was saying that um, God steps back mm -hmm. and he leaves us to our own ways. And because of our own ways, we reap the consequences. Mm -hmm. So there's always consequences. And what if, so are we in the state that we are because of our choices? Yes. So the people in the hospital, they're sick. They're sick because of their choices. Well, hold on. Now, 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 be careful. We, ha we suffer consequences not just because of our choices, but because of choices of people who went before yeah. us and the whole sinful thing. Um, you know, if, if a drunk driver drives across the freeway and hits you head on and you die, it's not your fault. I mean, you might have done some other bad things, but, you know, that particular instance is not your fault. So... Uh, we're, we're, we're saying we not only commit sins ourselves, but we live in a sinful environment. The whole situation is sinful. And it's the only spot in the, in the universe where there's death going on. And for, for that reason. So why, does, why do you say that, um, that God doesn't pull the trigger? Well, because it's, it's, like Norm says here, there's some protection over us right now, even though if he withdraws the protection, we would be, the consequences would come down, we'd probably die right then. So um, there's a point where he's going to stop that protection and he's going to pull that away. He's going to let us reap the consequences of what we had chosen for ourselves. But when, he, when is that point when he lets us do it? When there's nothing more to be gained by, by waiting any longer. So he pulls the trigger. No, he doesn't pull the trigger. It couldn't <laughs> happen unless it got past his passive will. Yeah. I mean, the, the change is, can only be made by him. Yeah, but you see, the, the abnormal situation is what we're experiencing right now. This is not normal. I know, but this ab is the, abnormal or not, it's being taken away by him. And, and at that yeah. point, we are getting it. Yes. Does this happen, does this occur when you have these little pockets of people that you were talking about, that their life is in danger, mm -hmm. they're being protected only by God, okay? And those people, their character is settled. The other side of the line, their character is also settled. Right. There is nothing more that God can do for them right. that will change their heart, their action, mm -hmm. they, no matter how much he tries, it's going to stay the same. That's the point mm -hmm. where he can say, these people are going to remain as they are, and these people are going to remain as they are, and the universe will agree, and it's perfectly safe to pull the life support. Okay, and where's your verse in the Bible for that? I don't know. Revelation 22:11. Revelation 22:11. Let's look at that for just a second. Revelation 22:11. Whoever is evil must go on doing evil, and whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whoever is good must go on doing good, and whoever is holy must go on being holy. And that's the point at which God says there's that I mean if 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 at some point circumstances lead us up to to a a, a, a situation 
And Revelation talks all about the circumstances that are going to lead up to that. But if, if a circumstances could be left to point, lead up to a point where everybody's made up their mind which side of the fence they want to stand on, then God says, why should we wait any longer? Then He takes an action. He takes an action. Okay. But it, that, it, that's, that's, there are those who would like to say that He does not take an action. No, He, he takes an he action. He takes an action and some die and some don't. But he's not the one who says you die or you don't. You are the one who says whether you die or you don't. That's correct. But God been... says, we're not, he says, okay, the time has come to stop being artificial. We're not talking about responsibility. Yeah. We've already assigned okay. that to us. We're okay. talking about mechanics. That, okay. <laughs> yes. Does God make this decision at the point in time when the universe watching how he's dealing with this mess says, okay, God, there's nothing more you can do. Mm -hmm. It's done. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, another few words from Ellen White. At the second advent of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. The light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. That's Desire of Ages 107-108. So what happens at that point is not that God says, well, I like you and I don't like you. That's all decided ahead of time. That's, we'd make that decision. Right. We're standing either on one side or the other side right. of that line, and God says, well, let my glory shine forth. Yeah. And when he does, now we don't, un this, the, the one part of this whole thing that I don't understand, I wish I did understand, is, is what changes in us that makes some be consumed and others enlivened, I mean, glorified. It's and it has something to do with the response to God's glory. Yeah. And, and, and the status of our character. Yeah. Well, Joel has taught us that um, a time is coming and there's going to be warning signs. And maybe it's happened in multiple times, but it's, it's, it's come to be called the day of the Lord. And Christians at the end will once again call it the day of the Lord. And sometimes we hear people calling, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And it might be inclined to think that this is kind of like calling wolf, wolf, wolf. Uh, it's a, a famous story goes along those lines. And these words, again, would be added, the angels of God and their messages to men represent time as very short. What was the quality of worship of those who are mistakenly looking forward to the day of the Lord? Well, the shortness of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us to fear the right action? This ought not to be. So, prophets are telling us, yes, there's a day coming like that, but the fear of saying, it's now, it's now, get ready, get ready. That's not going to be the motive. It's going to be the people who get prepared in times when there's not the hue and cry that are going to be ready when someone says, now. Well, it's going to be a day where he is the subject, mm -hmm. for sure, with everybody. Mm -hmm. It's not just the righteous, but the unrighteous. What is the primary process of getting ready? Well, it's by beholding we become changed. It means... If we look at the life of Jesus, we're surrounded by a sinful world. Are we attracted to Jesus and becoming more like him? Or are we attracted by everything that's around us? And if we are more attracted by what's out there in the world, then you know which way we're going to go. If we're more attracted by what we see in Jesus, that's the way we're going to go. Well, I don't want much of the world, just, just a little piece of it. Is that okay? <laughs> so, so it's attraction? Well, I mean, I mean, because yeah. you can take that pretty far because mm -hmm. um, people have been tempted for, to do something and they didn't do it, mm -hmm. but they've been attracted. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm, I'm not I was so talking, sure. I, I was talking about attraction in terms of a lifelong process, not that, what you did just today you or just tomorrow. You just do it. You, 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 you gradually, you're gradually heading in one direction or the other. Yeah. Well, you, We've addressed the, the issue that, that Joel was talking about, these calamities which, which get labeled as the day of the Lord. 
we put his name on it and, and we assign some sort of responsibility to him mm -hmm. for these events, whether it's a tsunami in Indonesia uh, or whatever. Um, in the book, Case for Faith, mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember who, who wrote that. Uh, um, yeah, but, um, I'll think about it for a moment. Okay, uh, but he interviews uh, Charles Templeton, yes. who was pulpit partner with Billy Graham yes. and threw it all up for atheism mm -hmm. or uh, agnosticism. But he, um, he, he's asked by the author here, was there something that caused you to give it up, to mm -hmm. give up your love for, for God and for Christ? And he says, yes, it was a photograph, the Photograph in Life magazine. Photograph of an African woman holding her dead baby in her arms with the most forlorn look on her face. Starvation. Starvation. This is in the midst of a severe African famine. Mm -hmm. And he says, I asked the question, who's responsible for this? Um, who controls the rain? You don't. I don't. He does. No, we do. So therefore, there could not be a loving God. Yeah. Well, he's interviewing uh, with uh, a Dr. Creech, I think is his name, or something like that. Strobel. Lee Strobel is, uh, is, the, is the author of the book. That's right. Uh, and Dr. Creech asks the right question, but cannot answer it. And that question is, could there be a greater purpose than, than you and me? Could there be something greater than ourselves or greater than what we see? And Adventists have the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And our neighbors want to know the answer to that question. Why are we in this mess? And uh, I wish we were a little more forthright in answering that question. Look at the book of Job. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, and um, there's growing evidence that cutting down the rainforest in the Amazon is largely responsible for the droughts in East Africa. For hamburgers. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, that's the, right. The, when you look at the history of Arabia and all through there and times long gone, there were trees, there was lush stuff. Man has abused this world for a long time. Yeah. So, well, we can't stay forever on the book of Joel. Let's move on to Amos. Amos was the first prophet in the Bible whose message was recorded at length. Now, not the one who wrote the most, that would have to be Moses, but whose message was recorded. He had a, he had a sermon, he had, he had a message, and, and it was a time of great prosperity, notable religious piety and apparent security. But Amos saw the prosperity was limited to the wealthy and that it fed on injustice and oppression of the poor. The main theme of the book of Amos is God's passionate concern for justice. And these words from the Message Bible introduction, more people are exploited and abused in the cause of religion than in any other way. Sex, money, and power all take a back seat to religion as a source of evil. Religion is the most dangerous energy source known to humankind. The moment a person or government or religion or organization is convinced that God is either ordering or sanctioning a cause or project, anything goes. I mean, think about Jim Jones and others like him. The history worldwide of religion-fueled hate, killing, and oppression is staggering. The biblical prophets are in the front line of those doing something about it. The biblical prophets continue to be the most powerful and effective voices ever heard on this earth for keeping religion honest, humble, and compassionate. Prophets sniff out injustice, especially injustice that is dressed up in a religious garb. They sniff it out a mile away. Prophets see through hypocrisy, especially hypocrisy that assumes a religious pose. Prophets are not impressed by position or power or authority. They aren't taken in by number, size, or appearance, appearances of success. They pay little attention to what men and women say about God or do uh, for God. They listen to God and rigorously test all human language and action against what they hear. 
Among these prophets, Amos towers as a defender of the downtrodden poor, an accuser of the powerful rich who use God's name to legitimize their sin. None of us can be trusted in, in this business. If we pray and worship God and associate with others who likewise pray and worship God, we are absolutely must keep company with, those, with these biblical prophets. We are required to submit all our words and acts to their passionate scrutiny to prevent the perversion of our religion into something self-serving. A spiritual life that doesn't give a large place to the prophet articulated justice will end up making us worse instead of better, separating us from God's ways instead of drawing us into them. So Amos. So uh, where did you, where'd you get that from? That was from the Message Bible, Introduction to Amos and the Message Bible. Is, is that actually true? I mean, yes. do, do, I thought tr prophets were just uh, messengers from God. It doesn't necessarily mean that their characters are, are great. I mean, there's a few prophets I can kind of talk mm -hmm. about that their characters weren't that great, but they were still pro prophets mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not so sure about that. You're not so sure. Well, no. even God can talk through donkeys. Well, that's right. That's right. And that's, that's basically what you're having there with a prophet. Aren't they a mouthpiece for God? Well, in the case of Amos, he starts out and he starts pointing a finger at all the nations around. And he prophesies about what's going to happen to them. And he does that around a couple of rounds like that, and then he comes down to Judah. And it's not good and things that he prophesies about the it's nations. It's not around. good things of what he says about these nations. And not good what he says about Israel either. And he really lays into them and says, you know, if, if you're going to continue sinning like this, and you're going to continue carrying on like this, how can you expect God to do anything at all good for you? Um, and there's some very interesting verses in Amos. I would like to focus on a couple of them. Look, for example, at Amos 3, verse 2. What do you make of this? Of all the nations on earth, you are the only one I have known and cared for. This is what makes your sins so terrible, and that is why I must punish you for them. Now, let's understand that Amos um, was prophesying at a time when there were three other prophets busy prophesying, Hosea and Micah and Isaiah. All of them prophesying roughly at the same time. And it was a time just a few years before the northern kingdom of Israel was going to disappear into captivity under the Assyrians uh, and be scattered to the winds, and they disappeared into history. We, lo we, we, ha we have no idea where they, I mean, there was no, they were so scattered they never came together again. So uh, what does it mean for God to say, only you I have known? Well, I would take a stab at that. Okay. Uh, you know, the introduction, uh, the first part of Romans 3, is there any advantage to being a Jew? Mm -hmm. The answer is, of course, mm -hmm. that, uh, that God gave the Jewish community his prophets, mm -hmm. that he spoke through them. He gave them a job and a responsibility to represent him, to represent him in this controversy between good and evil. And it looks as if, if we let him down, and misrepresent him or fail to represent him, uh, God will be displeased. I mean, we can look at uh, the case of Moses. He wasn't kept out of the land of Canaan because he, he killed an Egyptian, but because he misrepresented God at the rock. Yeah. That seems to be the one sin that, that God has a hard time tolerating, is misrepresentation. And maybe he's talking about that here, that the children of Israel were not representing him the way he wanted them to represent him. The, the word known in Scripture often uh, refers to a very intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Special project. And, and certainly he had taken Israel out of Egypt and at Sinai desired a very special relationship with mm -hmm. that with that community wanted them to be a light for him to evangelize mm -hmm. the world 
And I think that's the context in which he says, you only have I known. You're the only ones that I've given the privileges, that I've given the information to, that I've given you, and you're responsible for it. A few verses later, he says these words, the sovereign Lord, this is verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7, the sovereign Lord never does anything without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we're in trouble today because we don't have a prophet? No, but you go up to verse 6. Mm -hmm. And about 10 years ago, you could apply this to a situation. Is the trumpet blown in the city and the people are not afraid? Does evil befall a city unless the Lord has done it? Mm -hmm. uh, God takes responsibility for all the bad stuff. I mean, he can, he can either intervene and make, let it not happen or make it not happen, or he can let evil things run its course. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Along with Amos 3, 2 about, that you read about uh, only Israel, only you have I cared for, let's not forget about Amos uh, 9, 7, and 8, mm -hmm. where it says, The Lord says, People of Israel, I think as much of the people of Ethiopia as I do of you. Mm -hmm. I brought the Philistines from Crete and the Syrians from Kerr, just as I brought you out of Egypt. Yeah. So, sounds even in the same book just a short time later that he's saying it's not just you Israel mm -hmm. that I brought out of Egypt I dealt I helped other peoples I helped other nations but you know they're as bad as you are yeah that, Almost. that's true I mean there's no one that he's not trying to help but he didn't give those countries the law in Sinai he didn't there was a whole host of prophets and, and messages and energies that God put into Israel that he didn't put into those others. About, How do we understand these, these verses that were just read? Um, I, I, I think it's, to me, it's important to explain them. We're looking at God's wrath, at God's behavior. Mm -hmm. How do we explain God? Our neighbors and friends want to know and, and we just say, you know, God, God did it. That's what it says. It says God well, did it. L let's talk about following on in Amos. Let's look at what he says. What kind of people is he targeting? Look at Amos 4, verses 4 and 5. The sovereign Lord says, People of Israel, go to the holy place in Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And sin if you must. Go to Gilgal and sin with all your might. Go ahead and bring animals to be sacrificed morning after morning and bring your tithes every third day. Go on and offer your bread and thanksgiving to God and brag about the extra offerings you bring. This is the kind of thing you love to do. But then if you drop over, and we don't have time to read all the verses in between, drop over to chapter 5 and come down to verse 18. How terrible it will be for you who long for the day of the Lord. We were talking about that in Joel, weren't we? What good will that day do you for... For you it will be a day of darkness and not of light. It will be like someone who runs from a lion and meets a bear. Or like someone who comes home and puts his hand on the wall only to be bitten by a snake. The day of the Lord will bring darkness and not light. It will be a day of gloom without any brightness. So that's pretty scary stuff. So why? The Lord says, I hate your religious festivals. I cannot stand them. When you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not accept the animals you have fattened to bring me as offerings. Stop your noisy songs. I do not want to listen to your harps. Instead, let justice flow like a stream and righteousness like a river that never goes dry. People of Israel, I do not demand sacrifice. I do not demand sacrifices and offerings when, during those 40 years that I led you through the desert. But now, because you have worshipped images of Sakath, your king god, and of Kaiwan, your star god, you will have to carry those images when I take you into exile and land beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is Almighty God. And there's other passages. We've already looked at uh, Jeremiah 7, where a similar, there's a similar message. God is saying, what you do in church on the weekend won't do you one bit of good if you're sinning as fast as you can all week long. And especially if you're rich and you're oppressing the poor, then, you know... There's no excuse eight, for it. What you read into, chapter yeah. 8, verses 4, yeah. and following there. Hear this, you who trample upon the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over? And when 
that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may offer a wheat for sale, that we may make an, the ephah small and the shekel great, and de deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may <coughs> buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the refuse of the wheat. Yeah. Terrible, terrible, terrible things going on. So Amos, we find here, is someone who stands up and speaks on behalf of the poor. Amos himself was a poor man. He herded sheep, and he, and, and he poked holes in, in figs. It's a very interesting story. There were, there were people growing a certain kind of figs down in the Jordan Valley, and these figs would not mature properly unless you poked a little hole in the very end. And so under these great spreading fig trees, there would be grass. So the shepherds from way down on the, on the plains by Philistia, Philistia would, would drive their herds up here and down into the Jordan Valley at certain seasons of the year. And the, and the sheep would eat the grass around the bottom of the trees because there was still some shade there. And Amos and the other herders would get up in the trees and poke holes in these fruits. And that's, that's the way he, he, he managed to survive. I mean, this, this is a poor man. And God says, you're just exactly the right kind of person I want you to go. I want you to tell people, you know, you, the rich people, uh, speak to them and tell them that it's, it's what they're doing is not right, that they need to change. And so Amos is in the Old Testament, uh, much like uh, some of parts of the New Testament, where Jesus clearly talks about the rich. And, and, and James, the, 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 over in his book, talks about the rich being abusing the poor and so forth. So again, our, our second minor prophet that we were talking about uh, in, in today is, is someone who really is saying what God is looking for is not fancy religious festivals, songs and pipe organs and fancy churches and all that kind of stuff. What God is looking for is individual people whose, li whose hearts are right and whose lives demonstrate by their daily activities that they care about the poor, that they care about the people around them, who show Christian love to all the people around them. And that message is very, very clear in Old Testament books like the book of Amos. You don't have to wait till you get to the days of Jesus for Jesus to talk about the golden rule. The golden rule is right here in the Old Testament and especially providing to different, different societies in the times of Amos. Hope you've enjoyed our discussion. See you next week.